Committee on Renewable Energy. I'm chair of the Select Committee, Senator Mark Leno. And you know, for all the many times I've been in these chambers, I've never sat in this seat, and I'm feeling very, very Boro-esque today. <laughs> I want to, first of all, thank the City of San Rafael for your hospitality today, in particular Mayor Al Boro and Council Member Greg Brockbank, who's with us today, who did arrange for the use of the city council chambers and also want to thank the city manager's office, Sylvia Gonzalez, and the city clerk's office, Esther Byrne, who assisted with the audio system, and also Leslie Alden with Supervisor Charles McLashen's office, who has helped identify speakers for the panel as well. So the topic of today's hearing is Community Choice Aggregation Act, which was AB 117 of 2002, Where Are We Now? So my interest today is to not only review the history of community choice aggregation, how it has benefited consumers in at least five other states in addition to the millions of Americans who benefit from publicly provided power, to look at the genesis of it, what the concept was, what the idea was in moving this statutory mechanism for the possibility for the option of community choice aggregation and how it would interact with the investor-owned utilities in the areas of the state where CCA might move forward. Once that's laid out, I want to hear from our panelists who are engaged in community choice aggregation uh, and those who are planning to move forward with CCA as to how it's been implemented and what some of the hurdles have been and how the interaction with the IOUs, in particular here in Marin County, PG&E, have worked out. Then also, we, of course, we've invited the California Public Utilities Commission to be here because, of course, as the regulatory body, uh, we need to know uh, any comments that the CPUC may have as to additional statutory authority that they might need so that we don't have any interference, as was laid out in AB 117, uh, by the investor owned utilities, and where the legislature may be helpful in smoothing the pathway and making sure that the legislative intent of AB 117 can best be fulfilled. So, with all of that said, we will let me see if I want to uh, throw anything else in. Uh, I do want to point out that AB 117 was very specific uh, with regard to the distribution utilities to cooperate fully, not to not interfere, but to cooperate fully with CCAs in their efforts to develop their aggregation programs. And this includes providing all necessary data as well as continuing to provide all of the metering and billing and collection and customer service to retail customers that participate in community choice aggregation programs. So our first panel uh, is made up of four speakers. Renata Brillinger from Climate Protection Campaign. Mike Campbell with Clean Power San Francisco. David Orth is here with the San Joaquin Valley Power Authority, Kings River Conservation District and Dawn Weiss from the Marin Energy Authority. So we thank you all for being here. And uh, you may speak in any order you may like. David, I think you have some of the historical perspective. Yes, thank you, Senator. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the, the San Joaquin Valley Power Authority for a long time was first out of the box and, and actually filed our implementation plan with the Public Utility Commission in January of 2007 and that implementation plan was certified just a few months later and we were uh, well along the way in trying to implement community choice for the greater Fresno area. To kind of highlight some of the challenges that we incurred along the way, I think the, there's about five of them that I'd like to cover in just a few minutes here and that is the, the first and perhaps biggest challenge was that the foundation of presumed cooperation from the incumbent utility proved to be faulty. Um, we have the unique position of having portions of our service area served by PG&E and other portions of our proposed service area served by Southern California Edison. And what we found was um, 
just a, a continuum of uh, opposition and non-cooperation from PG&E, which uh, went against the whole reason why we pursued community choice in the first place. We had looked at municipalization as a group and felt, based on the representations of PG&E in the legislative, regulatory, and public arenas, that cooperation could be expected, that that was a quicker path to our objectives of local investment and in infrastructure and customer choice um, than to pursue the more traditional municipalization route. Um, as we proceeded through our process, PG&E first challenged the joint and several liability provisions of our organizational agreement. Uh, the Power Authority is formed under, under the California Joint Powers Act, and as provided in that act, um, had a provision that the members would be individually responsible for their share of the JPA's uh, obligations, but would not be jointly and severally liable. Uh, pg e challenged that, forcing us to take an issue uh, petition before the Public Utility Commission, and through a process and a challenge and rehearing, ultimately received a decision from the Commission favorable to our non-joint and several liability clause. We then entered into a long battle of um, uh, misrepresentation regarding the bond obligation. As required by law and regulation, there is a bond to be posted, um, and PG&E began to make the rounds in our local communities and argue that our bond requirement would be in excess of $140 million, thus threatening the entire economic viability of our program and creating a joint and several risk to each of our members in, in ungodly amounts. Um, we sought assistance from the Commission. Uh, the Public Utility Commission issued Resolution E4133 in December of 07, finding that the interim bond of $100,000 would suffice, that being the same bond that's posted for energy service providers under the Direct Access Program. Um, but the Commission also in that decision indicated that they would review the issue further which led PG&E to continue to represent, misstate uh, the, the risk that the bond amount would create. That issue is now subject to a settlement agreement that's under review and consideration by the Commission, and uh, it's, it's clear to the accurate to say that the bond requirement will be significantly less than the $140 million that was represented during the campaign. Um, that campaign then for, uh, shifted to an aggressive uh, campaign and marketing effort against our individual members to uh, encourage them to withdraw before risks were incurred. Um, the Power Authority was forced to file a complaint with the Public Utility Commission seeking more standard, specific standards of conduct and through a long process ultimately reached a settlement agreement with the Commission's assistance. Um, a key provision of that settlement agreement was acknowledged by PG&E that it had changed its previously neutral position on community choice aggregation in January of 2007. There were other agreements and provisions in that settlement that tried to eliminate or, or set a standard of truthful, non-misleading marketing and lobbying, um, and there was a dispute resolution process that we then went into regularly to try to address what we felt were misstatements. PG&E then initiated an early opt-out provision, uh, which I think you'll hear from, from a number of the panelists this morning, um, uh, encouraging customers to opt out before even the details of our program were made available. We again raised that first to them through settlement, dispute resolution processes, um, and then ultimately to the commission, uh, who ultimately then provided guidance on how opt-outs would be communicated in a fair and efficient manner to inform CCA customers of, of the decision that they had available to them. Um, finally, it's, it's just, it's accurate to state that uh, all of these actions in combination and other things really forced the use of limited public resources um, to hold off these uh, obstructions rather than to work with us in a cooperative manner to, to implement community choice in our region. That combined with credit market uncertainties and the financial condition of our individual, individual members uh, led us to temporarily suspend our efforts in June of 2009. We are currently watching the marketplace, 
um, exploring regional projects. Uh, we've got a request for proposal out right now for a regional distributed solar program for our members, and KRCD is evaluating some small hydro opportunities to support the region. I think from a success perspective, even though we're, we are temporarily suspended, uh, I, I'm pretty proud of what we've accomplished. We've blazed the trail, um, we've fleshed out some key issues for, for the people that you will hear from next, and we've certainly created an awareness amongst the, the communities in California and amongst the communities in our region of the opportunities of choice, and the opportunities of local investment and other opportunities for regional energy collaboration. Let me close with three recommendations for, for the committee to consider as you uh, proceed through the day and, and through the next legislative cycle. Um, given the utilities market power and, un, and potentially unfair competitive advantage as the incumbent utility, um, legislation is needed to ban marketing efforts by the utilities as it relates to community choice and to force functional or actual separation of PG&E's marketing and utility functions. CCA law, AB 117, and the regulations that followed were developed under the premise of support or cooperation from the incumbent utilities, and that has proven to be false. The law needs to be changed to reflect the realities. Secondly, the law needs to clarify that cities and counties can form a JPA and can um, uh, form that JPA without joint and several liability as demanded by PG&E when our initial service agreement negotiations were pursued. And then finally, I would suggest that uh, in order to more quickly advance community choice within the state of California, that the eligibility should be expanded beyond cities and counties. The law presently only authorizes cities and counties to pursue community choice, but that law be expanded to include special purpose local government agencies who already have statutory authority and experience with energy uh, development. That would allow a district like Kings River Conservation District to implement community choice for our rural customers uh, without having to first seek uh, the, um, the approval of our, of our um, uh, incumbent city councils and, and uh, board of supervisors. I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning and I'm available to answer questions. Mr. Orth. Would you be able to list two or three reasons as to why your authority began to pursue CCA initially? Was it for a greater opportunity of accessing renewable energy? Was it for greater local control? I mean, our top priorities? Our primary objective was to uh, bring the local governments together to make what we believed were necessary investments in the generation infrastructure serving the greater Fresno area. Um, we had looked at the uh, California Energy Commission studies that forecast and continue to forecast energy shortages in the greater Fresno area. It's very uh, dependent upon imports of energy from other regions of the state, and we felt this would be a great opportunity for local governments to come together and invest in and become part of California's generation uh, solution and make those local investments. Out of that, we felt community choice would also provide customers with choice and stability and allow us to create a generation portfolio that was responsive to our region's needs, including renewables. Did air quality factor into this at all? Air quality was certainly an important issue for us. Um, the San Joaquin Valley Basin is, uh, is uh, in severe attainment standard. Um, we felt that there were still opportunities to create uh, new generation that would support the region that were sensitive to their, those air quality issues. And if it were for some of the interference that you've described by the utility and the expenditure of public resources to play defense in your attempts to move community choice aggregation forward, if it weren't for that interference, where do you think you would be today? I think we would be delivering energy to a number of customers, um, perhaps all of the proposed customers within the Power Authority. Uh, our program was initially slotted for a startup in November of 2007, but because of the reasons that I've shared with the committee today, we had to continually push our startup date back as we stumbled through these issues that were thrown in front of us by the incumbent utility. Um, 
We had a contract that was ready to sign uh, in uh, middle of 2008. Um, we, were, we were prepared to move forward, but we were still battling with some of these issues. And ultimately, the credit market combined with just a recognition of continued battle with the utility led us to suspend. But I, I believe we would be running. So if I hear you accurately, what you're saying is that the interference wasn't just minor annoyances. It was a direct assault on your success and ability to move forward successfully. That is correct. And yes. that the interference, in fact, proved successful for the utility and caused your failure. That, that interference prevented us from proceeding as we had intended in 2008, 2009, um, allowing the utility to keep their customers as they intended. I have a letter that you, Mr. Orth, wrote to Thomas uh, Bortoff of PG&E on November 24th of 2008. And in it, you make mention of your concern with the PG&E maintained web page uh, with what you describe as misleading information relative to their opt-out efforts. Uh, in one point you say PG&E's web-based opt-out process has not been authorized by the CPUC and is contrary to the orderly opt-out process authorized by the CPUC for CCA programs. Yes, the, um, our concern there was that the legislation was very clear that the customers um, have an opportunity to opt out of community choice through a, through a series of notices two months prior to cutover and two months subsequent to the cutover to community choice. And PG&E jumped out ahead of that process as it was planned for our region and started encouraging customers to opt out um, through uh, internet access or through response to a flyer that they were handing out to key customers as they were uh, performing briefings and ut normal utility customer account service. Um, we didn't even have details of our program in place. We felt that was outside of the spirit of the legislation, that was clearly outside of the spirit and, and intent of the regulation, that opt-out was supposed to be an orderly process after the final details of a CCA program are communi communicated to the customer. Uh, to get a customer to opt out early um, can only be done with false and misleading information because there is no final factual information being presented for the customer to consider. Did AB 117 also require that any opt-outs be ratepayer initiated? Yes. And this clearly would be contrary to that. This, well, this, this provision was still um, would take action by the ratepayer, but it was simply, you know, go onto the internet and push a button and, and we'll make sure that we, we the utility, will make sure that you're opted out of this program. So this was not, um, to, to my understanding, a uh, circumvention of the ratepayer's decision. It was just an encouragement of the ratepayer to make a decision before the facts were before them. Okay. And then lastly, did you contact the CPUC to let them know what was going on and what was their response? We, um, we did contact the PUC and asked uh, the Energy Division staff for some guidance on how to deal with this issue. We had initially attempted to resolve it through our settlement dispute resolution processes to no avail. Um, we asked the Energy Division staff for some assistance. They made a phone call and were, were advised that by PG&E, by Mr. Bottorf, that they would take the early opt-out off of the internet. However, um, we subsequently found that that did not happen and we were forced to um, work with uh, the other parties at the table here to file a petition for more specific rules as it relates to when opt-out can take place. And there has been a decision uh, subsequently rendered by the Commission that provides guidance to the utility, specific guidance as to when and how opt-out will be processed. And in your three recommendations you just shared with us, the first being ban the marketing efforts, if that ban had been in place, you would not have to have experienced that which you were writing of concern to Mr. Bottoff uh, in November 2008. 
I think I would argue that yes, the, if, if we'd had a complete ban on marketing, then um, you know, clearly what PG&E was doing with these early opt-outs were marketing customers to remain in their program. Um, I think the ban on marketing combined with the, the more specific rules on how opt-outs will be processed um, would be very beneficial to CCAs seeking startup in the future. And under the current legal scheme, is there more that you think CPUC could or should have done, and if you think they should have done more but couldn't legally so, what changes do you think we need to make with regard to their authority? I think the, the, the Public Utility Commission and its staff have been very helpful to local communities attempting to put community choice programs together. They certainly were responsive to us as um, we you know, repeatedly had to stand before them and argue issues like joint and several liability and the standards of conduct and those sorts of things. Um, I believe that um, they did everything that they felt they could possibly do within the scope of the law. I think, as I suggested earlier, uh, legislation that would allow for ban on marketing, for uh, functional and actual separation of marketing and utility activities, um, and the, uh, the provision or clarification of how opt-outs will process um, would provide them with some additional um, latitude in establishing rules and regulations. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Arthur, for joining us and for all the information you shared. Thank you. Right. Who's up next? I'll be next. Okay. So I'm Dawn Wise with the Marin Energy Authority, and I'm going to respond to your questions in the order they were provided. Um, the first question relates to challenges that we had establishing the CCA program, and so I'm going to um, run through a few of those um, uh, as quickly as I can uh, in, order, in the order that they occurred. Uh, as we began exploring the formation of a CCA here in Marin County, there was a lot of lobbying of city councils, interest groups, and decision makers to not join the CCA program or to pull out of the CCA program. PG&E sent representatives, um, many by the way, uh, which are not on the shareholder side of the business, uh, to come and speak uh, in many cases behind closed doors with our decision makers, board members, uh, board of supervisors, uh, representatives, city council representatives. Uh, and other uh, key stakeholders in the community. Um, they also testified publicly in many of our um, city council chambers, um, uh, providing information that in many cases was very misleading, very uh, inaccurate, and also um, proposing alternatives, uh, which they framed as alternatives to a CCA program, which really are the energy efficiency programs that they're required by the state to provide anyway. Um, those were framed as alternative uh, programs that they'd be willing to offer to city councils that wanted to work with them exclusively and choose not to join the CCA program. pg e then began a negative marketing campaign in uh, 2009 that uh, went through 2010. I have a few of the pieces here. Um, if uh, folks want to look at them, um, they were uh, very fear-based, um, really uh, encouraging folks to um, uh, be fearful of this new program and included a lot of misinformation um, in the mailers, which I'll explain later. Um, they later, uh, in 2009, began threatening a CEQA lawsuit against MEA on the grounds that we would be executing a power purchase agreement with a wholesale provider. I think it's worth noting that uh, PG&E executes power purchase agreements all the time throughout the year and, and they do not go through a CEQA process for those unless there's something new being built, and that certainly was not the case with us. So um, this was deemed to be very inappropriate, and we um, incurred a great deal of legal expense uh, ensuring that we would be protected against any type of CEQA lawsuit. PG&E then uh, refused to sign the implementation plan that we submitted to the CPUC in December. We incurred a good deal of legal expense um, negotiating with them and trying to um, uh, work uh, with the CPUC playing a mediating role to, uh, to get them to uh, sign a service agreement um, that, uh, after the approval of our implementation plan. Uh, that was uh, a big hurdle for us in the um, December-January time frame. Uh, then pg and began a phone banking effort in February of 2010 where they were calling, uh, our, uh, well, they were calling all the customers, energy customers in Marin County, and encouraging them to opt out. These were PG&E initiated calls. 
Uh, they were placed uh, at a time when customers had not been provided with the terms and conditions of the CCA, so they had went no way of understanding uh, the program except for the phone call they were getting from uh, PG&E, and they were encouraged to opt out on the spot on the telephone call. In many cases, we got reports that the, the customer service representatives really didn't know what the CCA program was. They were making statements on the phone uh, saying that PG&E had signed a contract with uh, an energy service provider, and in some cases they mentioned PG&E had signed a contract with Shell Energy to provide greener power and that customers needed to opt out in order to get this greener power. They were also told that if they didn't opt out, they may not um, be able to, they would not be guaranteed that they would have reliable energy supply. Many customers were led to believe that their lights wouldn't come on, uh, their heaters wouldn't work if they did not opt out of the program. And the mailers said similar things as well. Yeah, the mailers uh, made comments about our, um, uh, there's a comment, well, there are comments that our greenhouse gas emissions um, are not going to be um, any lower than PG&E's, um, that, that uh, PG&E will have greener content in their power mix than we do, um, that our rates were not set in a public setting, that they were uh, set behind closed doors. Um, certainly our uh, rate setting process is probably more open than theirs, and our, um, our power supply contract is completely, uh, it's posted on our website, completely transparent. Um, furthermore, the marketing material that was being sent out was encouraging customers to opt out outside of the defined opt-out process, which Mr. Orth was just referring to, um, that the commission had already laid out needed to be followed. Again, they were not following that opt-out process. This is an example of um, a local paper um, uh, encouraging people to clip out this coupon and mail it back to PG&E to opt out. Um, two methods of opting out had been specified in our opt-out notices, website, and phone call. Um, mail was something PG&E said they, they uh, did not want us to include in the opt-out process yet. Uh, uh, about a few weeks later, they began encouraging people to opt out. Another um, uh, untrue statement in this mailer and in a couple of their mailers is, it says, um, if you, you can always choose to opt back in after you've seen how this unproven government agency does its job. Um, that's actually not the case because PG&E has a three-year requirement that requires that once customers um, are, choose to stay with PG&E, they cannot go back to the CCA program. Um, so there, there are quite a few misleading or completely untrue statements in the mailers that went out. And unfortunately, this information has stayed with our community. Many people believe that these are true statements. And it's very difficult to refute them after the case, um, after the fact. Um, the, next, the next comment I wanted to talk about is the transfer of customers itself was very difficult. We uh, sent a list of the customers that we wanted to enroll in the CCA program, and pg &E was unable to enroll several subsets of these customers, uh, several, you know, a batch of 800 had, had technical difficulties, another batch of 300 had technical difficulties. Um, there was then a long delay in billing for many customers, which caused customers to have, uh, in some cases, a one their first month bill when they were being served by NEA. They had a, a very unusually low uh, amount on their bill because uh, our charges were not included. And then the following month, the charges would be bunched up and the the dollar amount in the bill would shoot way up, causing customers to believe that the MEA program was causing their uh, rates to be much higher, when in fact um, that was not the case. We set our rates to match PG&E's rates. Um, so the transfer of customers was difficult. It, it's hard to say whether that was intentional or not, but it was certainly was detrimental to the uh, to our process and the number of opt-outs uh, that we saw happening. So they would have seen, as you described, a real spike mm -hmm. in their first month. Do we see it come down the second mm -hmm. month? They would see, months? yes, they would see it start to level off, yes. It's still higher than that month mm -hmm. prior. No, the second, by the time they hit the second month, it should be back to normal. But, but still higher than the month preceding the spike. Correct, because there were no generation charges on that initial So month. if they took out their bills to compare, it would, even after the spike, appear mm -hmm. that, that now that they were with MEA as opposed to pg &E, they were still higher than what they had been before. That's correct. Also, our large customers, uh, in Marin County were, um, saw a over two month delay in getting their bill, their first bill where there were MEA charges on there. Um, and this, this caused them, of course, internal problems. These are, these are both um, 
municipal agencies, our water district and our county of Marin, um, and for them to get a bill two months late at the end of their fiscal cycle was uh, very disruptive and um, you know, unfortunately associated with MEA, um, although it was out of our control to make that process work more smoothly. Customers that were on the balanced payment plan, these are customers that want to get uh, to pay the same amount every month and they are in pg and &E system as balanced payment plan customers. These customers were actually double charged for generation because pg and &E was unable to decouple the generation charges and the non-generation charges on their bill. These customers were double charged from May through the end of August and we worked very hard to um, to try and have pg and &E resolve this issue and it wasn't until we engaged the CPUC Energy Division staff in the summer that they um, really forced pg and &E to solve this problem. So this meant that customers were paying higher bills because they were being charged twice for generation and we're sure that's not what the legislation intended. Um, we're still trying to determine if these customers are being charged according to the correct methodology and there have been some, um, there's been some difficulty getting information from pg and &E on how these customers are being charged. So even a year later, we don't know for certain that they've been credited with the double charge? That's correct. And what process is in place to, well, that's more a question, I think, for the PUC, but how do you see this finally be resolved? Well, it would be helpful if we could receive some sample bills of customers. pg and &E is not willing to provide them to us for confidentiality reasons. However, if the customer information was redacted, we would still be able to do the calculation. Uh, that's been our request. They have been willing to provide the balance payment plan customer bills samples to the Energy Division staff. However, the Energy Division staff may not have the um, technical expertise to analyze the methodology and be sure, make sure that it's being applied correctly. So we're still waiting for a, a resolution of that issue. Uh, and then the last issue I'll mention as far as uh, p past challenges, and this one flows into the current challenge as well, but the call center, pg and &E's call center has been giving out incorrect information with very negative consequences. Um, they have been telling customers that there is no three-year rule, that customers that opt out will be free to return to the CCA at any time. Um, this information even came from a, a, someone at the supervisor level at uh, pg and &E's call center. Um, customers have been told that if they are a net energy metering customer, they will get paid higher rates if they stay with pg and &E. That also is not the case. We pay one cent per kilowatt hour premium for customers um, that, that pg and &E does not pay. And then also they have been told by the call center that their rates have gone up because uh, customers are with MEA. Um, that couldn't possibly be true. Our rates have never changed. Our rates were set in May to match pg and &E's rates. The, um, I'm going to move on to your next question, which is where we are in the process. Uh, this will be brief. We launched and began serving customers in May of this year. We are currently serving all of our phase one customers, which represents about 20% of our load. We expect to be rolling out to our remaining 80% within the next uh, uh, 12 months or so, 12 to 18 months. We are currently serving approximately 9,500 customers. We have achieved a compliance with a renewable portfolio standard, and we are um, currently uh, supplying a mix that is 26.5% renewable energy. It's about double what customers were getting before at competitive rates. We are also 78% greenhouse gas free this year, and um, we are looking forward to um, increasing the amount of renewables in our mix as we go forward. The next question is, what challenges are we now facing? And I, I'll list a few here. There is um, one of the things that we have requested from pg and &E is that the bill differentiate between generation and non-generation charges. It's very confusing for customers to look at their bill um, and see electricity charges in two different places, but no difference between those two charges. Um, pg and &E has not been willing or able to make that differentiation, and as a result, the majority of our opt-outs are customers calling, believing that they're being double charged and asking to opt out. Um, pg and &E continues to show the bundled rate in the bill, so customers are seeing what their rate uh, for the pg and &E charges, they are seeing the bundled rate, which is what their rates would be if they weren't being supplied by a CCA. 
This makes it so that a customer cannot recalculate their bill and have it make sense. This is out of compliance with PG&E's tariffs, which require that their bill be clear enough that a customer can recalculate their bill accurately. If you add up the, um, the breakdown on the bill, you end up with a much higher number than is actually on the bill. So this is a problem and is causing some customers to opt out and certainly causing many more customers to be confused and not understand the charges. Uh, pg e has been unable to um, make this change on the bill. Uh, we have not been able, uh, initially we were provided with data on which customers are care customers that are receiving a lower rate. This was important to us because we have an equivalent rate that provides a, a care-like rate to any care customers. But uh, recently, within the last month, pg e has um, taken the position that they will not provide us with information on which customers are care customers. Uh, so we are now not being informed when a customer signs up for care so that we can offer um, an equivalent rate. Um, we see that, this as a significant issue in our community. We want to be able to provide care rates to customers. Um, the next item is we continue to see call center misinformation from pg e and no effort to proactively address the problem. We requested um, uh, some proactive resolution and one, one suggestion that we had is that a subset of their call center be specially trained in CCA issues. Um, so that they would be prepared to respond to the types of questions that come up um, because they have such a large call center and such a large service area. It's difficult for them to train their all, all of their call center representatives on CCA issues. Uh, we believe a subset uh, call center might be a solution, but we're certainly open to other solutions. Uh, however, none have been provided to us. Um, uh, there have been a number of regulatory games, and I won't go into these in detail, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, PG&E is proposing many things uh, at the CPUC that would be harmful to us as, as a CCA program. One is the conservation incentive adjustment uh, shift, uh, taking the, t the tiering effect off of the uh, generation side of the bill and moving it to the non-generation side of the bill. Uh, the, there seems to be no uh, reasonable rationale for doing this except for it being an anti-competitive action. I think there's mention of that today in the Marin Expenditure. Yes, it's in the Marin IJ. Um, and it's also part of the uh, general rate case phase two. That's where this issue is being uh, discussed at the CPUC. Then uh, of even more significance is the power cost indifference adjustment, also known as, as the PCA, PCIA, and also referred to sometimes as, as the exit fee. When customers depart from PG&E's load, in order to make sure that they aren't left with stranded costs, there is a charge that these customers pay to um, offset uh, any power that might have been procured on their behalf. Is by that PG. the same as the cost responsibility surcharge, or is that slightly different? It's a different, uh, those, those two combined are the exit fee, the cost uh, recovery surcharge is a different calculation. That's more for infrastructural costs? Correct, yeah. So the PCIA calculation um, is is something that we pay on behalf of the customer so that they are not stuck with any extra cost for moving to the C CCA program. But unfortunately, the PCIA is currently being calculated um, using uh, very um, inaccurate metrics. Um, it's using a market price referent that is uh, very divergent from actual market costs. Uh, it's very favorable to PG&E uh, and the other IOUs and not accurate. And it also includes charges for renewable energy that's being built now, even though pg e is not in compliance with the renewable portfolio standard, and there's no possibility that they would be using renewable assets as stranded costs. So it doesn't make any sense. So the PCIA- It may um, not make sense, but it makes dollars. It makes dollars. <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, then I'll mention two others. The, uh, there's been a settlement discussion lately related to combined heat and power that um, Many of the IOUs have been uh, working with local providers, and uh, the settlement discussions did not include any CCA uh, entities, yet the outcome of the settlement has um, included CCAs as being required to participate in buying combined heat and power as part of our load. If we do not buy combined heat and power as part of our load, then PG&E will buy it for us, and we will be required to pay them back for it. Um, 
we believe that we are able to um, meet and exceed renewable standards and greenhouse gas emission standards without having to pick a specific technology. We're also interested in local supply and locally in Marin County we do not have a lot of industrial load that would be conducive to CHP. And then the last item that I'll mention on the regulatory front is the requirement that we post a bond to um, cover any um, uh, return of load to PG&E. We see this as double, double coverage because the PCIA is already there uh, to cover it and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the last question. Uh, the next before, question. Before you go on, sure. I would imagine you continue to communicate with the CPUC about all of these concerns. Yes, we are um, spending a lot of our resources on uh, legal, uh, reg regulatory legal um, consultants to assist us on all of these fronts, um, and we're spending a lot of internal staff time on these issues as well. And what kind of response are you getting from the PUC? Um, none of the items that I've mentioned have um, made it far enough along to, to say for sure, but I, I will say that the, the commissioners and the commissioner's offices have been uh, very open to hearing our concerns, and uh, we believe that they're being taken seriously. Uh, I think you're being very gracious and generous, which is always appreciated. But my concern is, and I'm sure it's your as well, that the interference just continues and continues and continues. We heard it from Mr. Orth going back two, three years. We're now coming into the fourth calendar year where all of these objectionable actions are occurring in every attempt to stop you from succeeding and attempting to make sure that you fail. I've, I've had conversations uh, both with staff and commissioners, and they point out to me that for obvious reasons, there has to be due process afforded to PG&E. They can't make a, a determination of their own that any of these actions are not in compliance with state law and with the intent of AB 117. The concern, of course, being that by the time that they get through any protracted due process, the damage will have been done and the victim will be on the floor. Do you have any suggestions as to how we can be both respectful of due process and at the same time, I don't know whether it would be through some sort of action of stay or some legal allowance to at least put things on hold so no more damage is done, so due process can occur. Yeah. I think that um, you're making an excellent point, which I was going to make, which is that the CPUC process as it stands now, um, which is really our only opportunity for intervention, is very costly and very lengthy. And we do not have um, extra uh, dollars or extra time to resolve these issues. And uh, as, as you're saying, that the damage is already done in many cases. Um, we believe there are a couple of things that, that need to be in place to, uh, to prevent this this sort of thing from occurring. Um, one is a code of conduct for the IOUs to follow or some, some sort of complaint procedure with teeth, with the ability to assess financial penalties or damages. Because as we've seen time and time again, pg and &E is very willing to bend the rules or flat out break the rules and be told that they need to stop and then stop after the damage is done and then do it again a slightly different way. And if there were financial penalties or some other type of enforcement that would actually cause harm to them, that would be one way to change their behavior before they, make, before they continue to make the behavior. Um, In such the, a case, though, isn't it possible that they could place the bet that they would risk facing, I'm just throwing out arbitrary numbers, but it could be in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of fines or penalties and just factor that as a cost of doing business, the beneficial result for them and their shareholders would be no more Marine Energy Authority. Correct. And that's why I think that both are needed. I think a code of conduct, uh, some type of um, reporting requirement or other type of requirement that says this is how you have to act. I think uh, David Orth mentioned a code of conduct around marketing or, or strictly separating marketing from the other functions. Um, but in addition to that, having the financial penalties so that there's, uh, there's a, uh, a code that they have to follow or a reporting process that shows how they're doing on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, uh, lists out what the issues are, 
um, tells how to um, how how they responded to each of the issues um, and allows CCAs to weigh in on how they responded to each of those issues. Um, having that type of formal process that's faster than filing a complaint and going through the lengthy month-long or sometimes year-long process is really important, particularly as CCAs are in their startup phase. And do you think that kind of detailed game plan would be for the CPUC to construct, or do you think that's something that the legislature could, as it did with AP 117, step in and say, this is how it will be done? I think um, whichever way is more expeditious. Um, Doesn't we, matter to you as long as it gets We would fully support. And, but I do think that, um, you know, as we've seen, I think that AB 117 was um, really uh, very written in a very visionary way and really seemed to anticipate what some issues might be and, and have language in there to, to, um, to ensure things could move forward. But now we know a lot more, and so whichever process, whether it's legislative or um, through the regulatory framework, I would encourage the parties um, working on it to look at some of the on-the-ground issues and ensure, kind of look at, kind of do a litmus test to see would this have protected against this issue? Would this process protect against any future similar types of issues? I think uh, working with the on-the-ground CCAs would be beneficial. I should let you get to your last response and then we'll ask some more questions. Sure, absolutely. There's a question here of what successes have you achieved? Um, I think that shifting the opt-out process to CCA control, as, as was done um, by Director Paul Clannon in May, uh, had a very big impact on our ability to, um, to, want to, to continue to roll out the process. Um, the the uh, outbound calls that pg and &E were making, pg and &E was making was very disruptive and it was impossible for us to control that process. Simply shifting it to the CCA control um, had a big impact on uh, our ability and continues to have a big impact on, on our ability to move forward. I think it's worth noting that um, some uh, representatives at pg and &E have been uh, dropping hints lately that they might, uh, they believe they may be able to start um, opting customers out now that the statutory opt-out period is over um, and we've clarified with them that that is not our interpretation. Uh, we believe we, um, uh, we would continue to handle the opt-out process even after the statutory opt-out period because it's still considered an opt-out but it's possible that uh, pg and &E will take that up as a new issue that we will then be fighting in the next few months and that they'll begin trying to do opt-outs in the way they were before. Um, another success is launching and having the general mechanics operating for the most part. Billing is working. Uh, PG&E is um, submitting, you know, fund transferring funds uh, over as they should be on a daily basis from customer revenue that they receive. And while there have been issues that I uh, outlined earlier, overall the process is moving forward and it, it is it is moving along. The renewable content and the greenhouse gas reductions were achieved quickly, and I see that as, our, as one of our very biggest successes. Congratulations. Thank you. The last question is what improvements can be made to the CCA Act to allow us to better operate? Um, I think the first point is the code of conduct uh, for the IOU, um, the ability to assess financial penalties or damages for lost customers, uh, and at this point it would be for lost customers for a three-year period. Um, legal expenses um, should be included as, as part of financial penalties and damages or communications expenses um, that are directly caused by IOU behavior. We spent a lot of uh, communications budget trying to refute a lot of this misinformation that was out there. Um, obviously we didn't have the, the as big of a size as, as a, of a communication budget so it was very difficult to do that. Um, currently the, the IOUs will continue to act in a way that serves their interest alone because there's nothing pushing them to do otherwise. They, their behavior has cost MEA in terms of lost revenue from, from departed customers, legal expenses, fighting the CEQA, uh, and these <coughs> other regulatory issues that I mentioned, and communications costs to refute their misinformation campaign. Um, we, we are happy to uh, pay for a regulatory interface as a part of doing business, but um, when pg and &E is acting in such a non-cooperative way, we believe it's uh, reasonable to allow for this. Currently, the CPUC is not um, allowed to assess financial penalties or damages, and that's um, been a real barrier, we think, and, and a reason why pg and &E has continued to behave in the way they have. Another issue that has impacted CCAs on the, res the regulatory front is the concept of indifference to the bundled rate payer. This issue, this uh, 
concept keeps coming up. And the way that the utilities and the commission have used this concept has excessively burdened CCAs. Uh, this includes the three-year return rule, the excessive exit fees, or the PCIA, and the CCA bond re requirement. I think it's worth noting that all rate payers benefit from our existence uh, because we're infusing competition into, into Marin County. So actually we're going to have to uh, conclude soon because we've got okay. uh, a few more folks here on the first panel and we've got to get to the second. Uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions as we conclude, and I'm sorry we don't have even more time. And your experience with this is uh, invaluable to us. You had mentioned in your earlier comments that there was lobbying done by PG&E in the early formative stage of the Marine Energy Authority and Clean Energy, Marine Clean Energy, uh, not on the shareholder side. How do you make that determination? Uh, by the names of the people who are participating in those hearings. Uh, they had legal consultants, folks that are on their procurement side, David Rubin, Chris Warner, folks that um, work on, uh, uh, they had EE people, energy efficiency uh, folks come to some of these uh, events and talk about their energy efficiency programs. So all of those individuals who you've named are paid by ratepayers? That's my understanding. And your concern is that they were, ratepayers were being charged to work against your efforts. That's correct. And, and the same is true with um, much of the marketing material that we saw around Marin County at that time saying, PG&E loves solar, PG&E loves wave power. Those sorts of things are paid for by energy efficiency dollars. And this is a concern to me because we've often heard this debate over whether shareholders or ratepayers we're paying for the many millions of dollars PG&E spent to try and stop your success, along with the $60 million that they spent on Prop 16, which we haven't even talked about yet, and then nearly $100 million that were spent by PG&E in political contributions over the last 10 years, the largest single contribution by any corporation in the entire state. And did you put that in writing and make a formal complaint to the PUC about that? particular issue? No, we were very concerned about it, but our resources are limited and we've, we've had to pick our battles carefully, but that's that's a concern and I think that the, the main thing is that they are not required to report on how they're spending their dollars, how they're spending their staff time, and that would certainly be helpful. If I may, there are two last um, right. recommendations right. that I have. First is the elimination of the three-year rule because many customers are making decisions based on false information. We don't think they should be required to stay with PG&E. PG&E even states in their own marketing material that you can return anytime. Therefore, we think the three-year rule That's should not be eliminated. Debatable. It's in print. It's in print, uh, paid for by them. Um, paid for by us. <laughs> yes. Um, and then the last thing is the elimination of the bond requirement uh, may be something that um, needs to be considered. This bond requirement is intended to return for, uh, to um, be there in the case that customers and mass have to be returned to PG&E as the provider of last resort. And I think it's worth mentioning that PG&E is not always the provider of last resort. As we saw in 2000, the state is the provider of last resort. <laughs> PG&E and the IOUs are not required to post a bond with the state to cover for the possibility of return of customers. We don't believe that it's fair for CCAs to be required to post a bond to cover the return of customers when there's already a PCIA in place. And it's worth noting that the other CCA, other CCAs outside of California do not have this type of requirement and we think it's onerous. Thank you, Ms. Weiss. It is a superhuman accomplishment that you're even here today to say that there is a Mr. Campbell. Good morning, Senator. My name is Mike Campbell. I'm with the San Francisco Clean Power SF program. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I will try to um, speak quickly, but uh, get through the points that I have here. Um, Mostly what I'm going to do is amplify on uh, what my colleagues here have already spoken about. A few things that I want to delve a little bit into is how some of the policies that, um, that currently exist actually result in the perverse uh, uh, result that a CCA customer would be um, providing a subsidy to the local uh, investor-owned utility through some of the fees and other things that we've, that we've talked about. Um, 
One is the, um, the PCIA charge. Not only do you have to pay a, a customer that joins the uh, CCA um, is required to, to pay for the quote, stranded costs of generation investments that the investor and utility has made. But some of those costs that are above market costs may very well be renewable uh, projects that the utility is paying for. And the utility gets the benefit of having a customer leave the CCA because it increases their RPS the renewable procurement standard numbers, so they, their renewable numbers look better, and some of those renewables would be paid for by the CCA customer, and they're not getting any benefit of that renewable. So at the very least, having um, it be clear in statute that uh, the CCA customer would be able to um, reap the, the benefits of fees they're paying for in a way that's fair and appropriate, I think is, is kind of a minimum bar that we can start talking about. Another along those lines, is the uh, access that CCAs could have for energy efficiency dollars, which are collected from CCA customers. Um, we're currently going through a proceeding at the CPUC to try to figure out how to make the, um, the process by which a CCA could um, have access to the funds that their customers are paying for energy efficiency uh, projects and programs. That's not currently clear, but one um, a challenge that we're also facing there is if the, it's just a basic issue of, of fairness, if a, if a CCA uh, customer is paying a fee that they are not able to avoid by joining the CCA, and that those funds go towards funding energy efficiency programs that the IOUs run, in our case PG&E runs, the benefit to PG&E there is one, the, the marketing benefit that PG&E has managed to um, reap from its energy efficiency activities, but also, um, whatever energy efficiency uh, savings are, uh, do result, help the, the PG&E's or the IOU's uh, procurement activities, reduces their procurement uh, profile, and would not benefit the CCA. So um, there may be some way that, uh, that, that I think that legislation could help in clarifying that CCA customers get the benefit of um, non-bypassable charges that they're, that they're required to pay. And those two uh, notable ones I wanted to hit off the bat um, are the PCIA and funds associated with energy efficiency. A couple other key, um, key points um, are the, what uh, my colleagues have already mentioned, um, is the ensuring that there are sufficient penalties and they're probably going to need to be severe for the reasons that you mentioned, Senator, to um, ensure that the IOUs cease interfering with the activities of, of CCAs. Um, and let's see, those are sort of the big high level ones I wanted to touch on first because I know the, the timing issue. Um, your office did have some general questions about where San Francisco is. I can go through those very quickly. Question, please. Yes, so um, the, the, uh, the main challenges that we're um, facing in establishing our CCA are ones that have been uh, well noted already this morning. Um, the primary challenges uh, consist of the aggressive tactics by PG&E to encourage the CCAs, um, some of the state rules that are in place, and some complex regulatory structures, and a few examples of those are the aggressive and misleading marketing by uh, PG&E against Clean Power SF. We've also been the, the target of um, mailers and, and, and direct communication with potential CCA customers long before we have a, a program or, or rates or like a minimum mailbox. In, indeed. Um, there are the uh, regulatory barriers to enter um, that, are, that are, could be used a little bit more um, definition. There's the issue of the bond amount that I think uh, Ms. Weiss uh, covered very um, thoroughly, so I want to touch on that. The uh, exit fees, which I mentioned, and then there was the, you know, the, the big gorilla, the PGD sponsored ballot initiative. Um, which uh, could have affected CCA to say the least. Um, there's also uh, some commercially unreasonable terms in the tariffs and the um, service agreement with PG&E. There's a standard service agreement that exists in, in the um, PG&E's tariffs in terms of what, it, and this uh, addresses the business arrangement between the uh, investor-owned utility and the CCA in terms of transferring data and all those types of things. We have been, the city has been successful in negotiating some of those terms with PG&E with the help of the um, CPUC staff mediating that to make some of those terms be ones that we could actually achieve from a business perspective. Um, but there's some technical 
uh, aspects of the, the service agreement in terms of how quickly a, um, just for an example, in, in, the, in the standard service agreement, there is a, an unreasonably fast turnaround in terms of when the CCA would get the data from their customer usage to when they'd have to provide the, the um, information about that, that usage back to PG&E. And the, if that is not responded to um, within the time frame of the service agreement, then there would be no um, CCA charge appear on the utility bill. So that's in the standard service agreement, and there's others that are um, equally challenging. Another item is, and I'm not sure this is a place for legislation, but just to, to highlight, um, is that there is no very clear form roadmap for CCAs. So um, our program has had the benefit of uh, San Joaquin, um, you know, taking the lead and being the you know trailblazer, but you know there has been no trail before, and it would be helpful if there were some more you know documentation and um, clear lines in terms of what um, what one entity would need to do to become a CCA. For example, the IOUs do have business manuals for how direct access providers would become a direct access provider, and it's pretty laid out in terms of a straight up um, process. So at best, when we're you know muddling through and figuring out what the process is, we look to those direct access documents as guidance, but then of course, the rules aren't the same. So then we enter into some of the challenges that, that my colleagues have mentioned. Do you have a timeline as to at all possible? Great, well, we wish you success. I'm great at ribbon cutting. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. Um, I have other remarks, but in the interest of time, I'm thinking maybe we should get to the last person on the panel unless there's questions you have for me. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Carolyn, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for, for uh, having this timely hearing, Senator. We're not a Burlington Climate Protection Campaign. We're a nonprofit organization in Santa Rosa, uh, and our mission is to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the local level. Um, that's primarily where we focus. Um, this, this is timely, as everyone I'm sure is aware. We've had a um, number of indications from the voting public in California that they, they want to see renewables come online. They want to deal with climate change. Um, Prop 16 going down, Prop 23 going down, electing a, a governor who ran on the platform in part on, based on the deployment of renewables. So we've, we've got the conditions that are right. We need some tools at the local level to, uh, to benefit from that and really accelerate. It's an honor to be on this panel. We haven't had the, maybe a dubious honor um, of being quite so embattled in Sonoma County. We don't have a CCA. Um, we, we have, um, I'll, I'll give you a few ideas of what we've got in terms of um, building blocks, um, but uh, I think the overarching comment I can provide is to say that the experience in these other three jurisdictions has had a significant chilling effect on other communities moving forward. So that's probably the, um, the most um, important comment I can offer. Um, we have put some building blocks in place though. We've got a, a commitment in all of our uh, cities and the county of Sonoma itself to an ambitious greenhouse gas reduction target, the most ambitious in the country at the, at the local level. We put together an action plan, a climate action plan that identified CCA as one of the most powerful financing and governance tools we could use to meet that target. Um, it, we expect if we can get a CCA in place that we could meet 46% of our, of our target um, by 2015. Um, we see CCAs being an incredibly important tool to, to, uh, to build and own community scale distributed renewable energy generation resources. We've, got, we've been awarded a, a partnership of organizations and agencies and the county was awarded a grant from the California Energy Commission um, under their new R&D program which is called Renewable Energy Secure Communities or RESCO for short. Um, our project is unique in the uh, awards that were granted under that program in that it's attempting a, to design a, 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 a county-wide renewable portfolio um, that would serve all of the county's needs. Uh, 60, 60 to 70% or so would come from local sources, the remainder secured on the wholesale market, um, and um, this would be done at competitive rates to what the current incumbent utility is offering. So we're in the process right now of a three year, we're about a year and a quarter into a three year program project to, to create a portfolio that would uh, uh, map all of the optimal sites in the county um, to, to meet our energy needs. 
it's a very exciting project and um, hopefully will serve provide some tools for other communities that, that want to um, do something similar and CCA is the tool is the is the governance and financing tool that makes it possible uh, so it's we're looking at some um, best practices and turning to some of the other communities who have tried this to look at what their governance model is that would help us uh, actually implement this so we'll have that tool in place and that will be the one of the key pieces of information going forward on an RFP to a, an energy service provider in the future um, so as I said that in terms of challenges that uh, in Sonoma it's a, it's a different ball game but uh, uh, certainly there's been a chill you know uh, first with looking at the experience in San Joaquin and Marin a lot of wait and see you know kind of um, attitude among local electeds and the business community Prop 16 certainly for a short period of time had a, a major chilling effect. It was really it was really impossible to have any uh, constructive conversation about CCA until that question was answered. Uh, since then, however, because of how uh, unpalatable that tactic was to so many uh, uh, local electeds and business leaders um, and environmentalists, that's been a somewhat something of a unifying. Um, experience so we, we're looking forward now to, to a more constructive progressive debate in the county about whether this is the right uh, direction for us to go. Um, in the course of doing the RESCO project we did collect um, some data from PG&E under the CCA tariff which is a, a requirement that they provide it. Um, it, it was um, th There's a tariff that, that fairly clearly articulates 17 types of data that, that are uh, the within the rights of local governments to uh, request, and we did eventually get all of that data. Um, we also asked for some data that isn't explicit in the tariff, and it's important data if uh, a community is looking to do what we are, which is to design a, a very high resolution portfolio to meet the needs of the, of the county and, and, and uh, have it be as realistic and feasible as possible. We did not uh, succeed in getting any data at the substation level um, of the grid. Um, and we did not succeed in getting any natural gas data, all, both of which are important uh, when doing a, a, a very high level um, design of the portfolio that would serve our needs. So that would be something I think that ideally would be uh, addressed in future either rulemaking or legislation. Um, as the others have said on the panel, uh, obviously some clarity, right, uh, regulatory or legislative clarity is needed uh, to define what constitutes cooperation, full cooperation, that goes without saying, under AB 117. And um, I think the, the leadership you're showing here today and hopefully will continue to cultivate in some of your colleagues um, sh will address a, a, a great need, which is to, to cultivate some legislative allies. Um, uh, since the, the bill was written, there hasn't been a, an active caucus or you know, collection of people that are really championing this as a, as a the powerful tool, which we believe it is. Um, and it's going to be essential, I think, to, to do fixes, to, to work with the PUC, uh, to work with communities to encourage them and, um, and support them in whatever ways they need. This is uh, a time, I think, for great innovation um, that's, that's being called for all of us, and we really need to be able to use all the tools at, at our disposal. So um, that, thank you very much. Great. We're going to move on real quickly. I just wanted to ask. Did you follow any of the communications between PG&E and uh, Ms. Weiss's office with regard to their accusations that the Marin Energy Authority's program would increase greenhouse gas emissions? Because I know you focus on mm -hmm. specifically that mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. So you, you were aware of it? Well, we've been watching from the sidelines, certainly. Um, we haven't been able to track the details because of a lack of resources ourselves. Uh, but certainly the, um, the, the, the impact it's had and the clear observation that requires tremendous resources to, to get out the gate on, out of the gate on this type of project. I did, I did forget to mention one thing, a resource you hopefully are aware of, but I would recommend you turn to, which is a, a California Energy Commission funded uh, report that came out in February of 2009 that has a number of recommendations about um, removing barriers to CCA implementation. Great. Thank you, Mr. Bellinger. Thank you for all your good work. Thank you. And thank you to our entire first panel.